Grape Nuts Flakes Brew. You. The Grape Nuts Flakes program, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Send him to work with a smile. That's what you want to do, ladies, isn't it? Because the worker who works with a smile works his best. And you can start your man off with a grin if you start him off with a big, luscious bowl full of delicious, flavorful Grape Nuts Flakes. Your favorite Grape Nuts flavor, a delicious, toasty brown flake form. There's something about that malty, rich, sweet-as-a-nut Grape Nuts Flakes goodness. There's something about that distinctive, different Grape Nuts Flakes flavor that starts your folks off in high. Yes, sir. There's an outstanding difference about Grape Nuts Flakes because they're made a different way. You see, they're a blend of two delicious grains, sun-ripened wheat and malted barley. And Grape Nuts Flakes are toasted to a delicate, crisp golden brown. That's to give them a texture just as swell as their taste. So for a really swell breakfast dish, for a treat that your folks will love to the last crispy spoonful... Ask for delicious Grape Nuts Flakes, America's fastest-growing breakfast cereal. That was Gobs of Love as played by the orchestra. Now, ladies and gentlemen... We bring you a man who turned in his Maxwell to the junk salvage drive last week. That's right. No car now. And this morning came all the way from Beverly Hills on a pogo stick with an off-board motor, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Great nuts flakes again. This is Jack Benny speaking. And Don, Don, a pogo stick is a good mode of transportation, but it's not the one I use today. Oh, uh, well, how did you come to work? On your bicycle? No. Roller skates? No. Well, I give up, Jack. How did you get here? It's simple, Don. I put on my track outfit, bent down on one knee, Rochester untied the goat, and wham, here I am. <laughs> In fact, I, I ran all the way. You should have seen him, Don. He runs like a deer. Thanks, Mary. An old, tired deer. <laughs> well, I made it. That's all I know. Imagine running ten miles. Why, you must be all worn out, Jack. No, no, I feel fine, Don. You see, I had to stay under 35 on account of my rubber shoe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, by the way, uh, by the way, Mary, how did you get here? Do you have any trouble? Of course not. I just stood on the corner of Sunset and Roxbury, fixed my garter, and wham, here I am. <laughs> oh, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Darn it. Yes, Jack, it might have worked for you, too. You have rather attractive limbs. Well. I've seen better looking limbs holding up Burma shave ads. <laughs> The word is signs there. <laughs> you got a much bigger laugh on signs. You know? At least, Mary, my legs were good enough to run all the way from Beverly Hills. I think they were trying to get away from your body. Oh. <laughs> Mary, I haven't got my car anymore. I ran to work. Now forget it. Oh, uh, I just can't get over it, Jack. A man your age running ten miles. Oh, for me, that's nothing, Don. Why, the first job I ever had, I used to run up and down all day long. Up and down. Up and down. My goodness, Jack, what were you doing? I was a grape smasher in a winery. <laughs> I had the bluest feet. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, Mary. Hello, Don. Hello, Phil. Phil isn't here yet. Oh, then I'll save it. Hmm. <laughs> Say, kid, how'd you get the studio today? It was easy. I paddled here in my canoe. In a canoe? It scrapes a little, but you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. Nobody else. <laughs> Say, Don. No more canoes for me. I nearly got drowned on Vine Street. What? Dennis, I'd like to find out one thing. How can you get drowned on Vine Street? Oh, it's a lot of trouble. You've got to fall in a manhole. <laughs> Well, that'll do it every time, kid. Well, 
Well, here he is. Hiya, Jackson. Look who I brung to the program. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. He's got his kid with him. Where's the baby's nurse, Phil? Alice won't let her go out with it. <laughs> Oh. Isn't she cute? Hello, honey bun. Honey bun, it's your Uncle Jackie. <laughs> What's the matter with that kid? Every time she sees me, she cries. Oh, she's probably jealous because you've got big blue eyes and feet to match. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Why, that's certainly a cute outfit the baby's wearing, Phil. Oh, look at those little shoes and those panties. Yeah, ain't them dapper diapers? <laughs> oh, they're darling. Say, Phil, we've got a long play to do tonight, so how about giving out with a band number? Okay, hold the baby. Well, come on, take her. Okay. I hope she... Oh, well, I'll take a chance. <laughs> uh, come here, darling. Come here to your Uncle Jackie. <laughs> there she goes again. Well, what'd you do to her, Jack? I didn't do anything to her. Quiet. Quiet now, darling. Ladies Quiet. and gentlemen, while Jack is attempting to calm down Phil's baby, let me tell you about America's most distinctive flake cereal. Those toasty brown sweet as a nut grape nut flake. You will find that grape nut flakes are a thrifty buy on the big 12-ounce economy size package. And be sure to look for Kate Smith's picture on the box. Well, okay, Phil, let's have your... Kate Smith's picture on the box. Did you say Kate Smith? Why, certainly. Don't you eat great nuts, Blake? Every morning, but I eat them out of a bowl, not out of the box. <laughs> Kate Smith. <laughs> Kate Smith's picture. Well, after all, Jack, Grape Nuts Flakes used to be her program. Well, it's mine now, and she better get off that box. <laughs> See? Now, don't get excited, Jackson. Don't get excited? Yeah, I come out all right. I wasn't drowned. <laughs> Who's talking about you? I want my picture on that box. Stop jumping up and down. You think you're back at the winery? <laughs> I know where I am. I'm going to straighten that picture business out right now. You better play something, Phil. Better die right. He better play something. While he's doing it, I'm getting on that phone. Mr. Chapin, the sponsor, is going to hear about this. Hello, operator. Get me long distance. New York. <laughs> But, but Mr. Chapin, but Mr. Chapin, as long as I'm on Great Nut Flake program now, my picture ought to be on the box. Sure, Kate Smith is a lovely girl. So am I. I mean, I'm a lovely fella. Now, look, look, Mr. Chapin, let's not bicker about it. All I want is a direct answer. Is it yes or no? Not so fast. <laughs> Anything I hate is snap judgment. <laughs> now look, now look, but Mr. Chapin, but Miss, but Mr., but Miss, but Mr., but Miss. Try Madam. But Madam. <laughs> Please. Now look at it this way, Mr. Chapin. Mothers all over the country are buying grape nuts, Blake. And the kiddies ought to have a chance to see a picture of their Uncle Jackie. <laughs> Oh, my. What's that, Mr. Chapin? Who's trying to get sympathy? That Phil Harris's baby, not me. All right, take it over, Mr. Chapin, and call me back. Goodbye. 
Well, that's my fault. After all, what did he accomplish talking over a telephone? Why don't you put on your tracksuit and run to New York? <laughs> well, I know one thing. I'm going to get my picture on that box. What box? Oh, be quiet. <laughs> now, let's get started with our play. <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are going to present our version of one of the most pretentious pictures of the season. None other... <laughs> None other than 20th Century Fox's production of that sparkling melodrama, that sophisticated epic, that dramatic thunderbolt, Tales of Manhattan. <laughs> Uh, thank you, crumb cake. <laughs> now this... <laughs> now this, uh, this picture, which was produced by Boris Morris and S.P. Eagle... What's the S.P. for? He came out from New York on the Southern Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> the, uh, gets it, Billy? <laughs> now this picture, among other great performers... Featured such famous stars as Charles Boyer, Rita Hayworth, Thomas Mitchell, Ginger Rogers, Edward G. Robinson, and Charles Lawton, all of whom will appear on this program tonight. Gosh, are all those big stars going to be on our show? Yes, and they should be here now. Where's our producer? Oh, uh, oh, Mr. Wells. Yes, Mr. Benny? Uh, did you get in touch with uh, all those stars and tell them to be here tonight? Oh, uh, let's see. This is going to be embarrassing. I can just feel it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, so you forgot to do it. Well, all I can say is, Welsh, you're a fine producer. Mr. Benny, in my office at Jung and Rubicum, I have 12 telephones on my desk. So what? If I ever get them untangled, watch my smoke. <laughs> couldn't call him up. He couldn't think of it. Well, what are we going to do, Jackson? Well, well, I'll think of something. Hey, Mr. Benny, I'll bet our play will never top the one Fred Allen did last week. Allen? Oh, is uh, Nasal Hazel back on the air? <laughs> uh, the last, uh, the last I heard of him, he was at the Mayo Brothers Clinic. Oh, did they operate on Alan? Uh, no, Don, there were so many things wrong with him, they just gave him a good luck charm and sent him home. <laughs> <laughs> well, so much for good news. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our play will go on immediately after. Which... I'll take it. Probably Mr. Chapin calling back. Hello? Oh, oh Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. <laughs> oh, hello, Rochester. What do you want? Boss, you know that buggy you bought to take the place of the Maxwell? Yes, what about the buggy? Well, I've been trying and trying, but I can't get Carmichael to pull it. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Rochester. With a little training, my polar bear can become just as gentle and easy to handle as a horse. But that bear's in an ugly mood. It's winter time, and he's supposed to be sleeping. This is war. Let him stay out. <laughs> now, Rochester, all you got to do is put the harness on him. Speaking of that harness, he had on me three times a day. <laughs> oh, he was just being playful. Did you put the bit in his mouth? Yeah, and he chewed it up like bubblegum. <laughs> well, that's your fault. If he doesn't behave, give him a good rap on the nose. A rap on the nose? Yes. Help is hard to get now, boss. Don't kick it around. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Well, let it go, and tomorrow morning I'll do the job myself. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? Are you coming home to dinner tonight? Of course I'm coming home to dinner. Okay. You have to go, honey. <laughs> honey, Rochester. Rochester. Honey, he can't be talking to Carmichael. Sing, Dennis. <laughs> At last, the sky 
eyes up above blue. My heart was wrapped in clover. The night I looked at you, I found a dream that I can speak to, a dream that I can call my own. I found a thrill to press my cheeks to, a thrill I've never known. You smiled, and then the spell was cast, and here we are in heaven, for you are mine at last. I found a dream that I can speak to, a dream that I can call my own. I found a thrill to press my cheek to, a thrill I've never known. You small, and then the spell was cast. And here we are in heaven. For you are mine. At last. That was at last sung by Dennis Day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction this evening, the Benny, acting as our meat, but we've been rationed players, <laughs> will present that sensational melodrama, Pants of Manhattan. That's Tales of Manhattan, isn't it, Jack? Of course it is, Don. I was just trying for a gag. I can't you know? stand a guy that presses, even if it's pants. <laughs> oh, sit down. Melon head again. <laughs> so here we go, folks, with our feature attraction. And as a special treat, I am playing the triple part of Charles Boyer, Charles Lawton, and Edward G. Robinson. This I gotta see. <laughs> You'll see it, don't worry. Take it, Mr. Wilson. <clears throat> Presenting Pants of Manhattan with that all-star cast, Jack Benny. Thank you. If you remember the picture, ladies and gentlemen, the opening sequence presented a tense love triangle featuring Rita Hayworth as the wife, Thomas Mitchell as the husband, and Charles Boyer as the other man. Uh, that is me, <laughs> Charles Boyer. Oh, pull up your eyelid. <laughs> hmm. The scene is the trophy room of the Long Island estate of Mr. Thomas Mitchell, the famous big game hunter. Mr. Mitchell is talking to his wife. Darling, I love you. You can't leave me, do you hear? You can't leave me. I'm sorry, Thomas, but I'm afraid this is the end. Well, what about our children? Our children that I play with every day. We haven't any children. They belong to the family next door. <laughs> oh. So that's why they're older than I am. <laughs> it's no use, Thomas. I'm leaving you at once. I know. It's another man. Tell me his name, Rita. Tell me his name and I'll kill him. Like in the picture. <laughs> no. No, you'll never know, Thomas. You'll never know the name of the man I love. Oh, Charles, darling. At last you're here. Rita, my beautiful. Uh, uh. <laughs> Keys, me. Excuse me, Mr. Boyer. Now, come on, Rita. What's the name of that other man? <laughs> Go away. Oh, Rita, my darling. Uh... <laughs> Close your eyes and kiss me again. How else can I do it? <laughs> Rita, I love you. Pardon me, Mr. Boyer. Now, listen, Rita. I wish you'd tell me who your lover is so I can go out and shoot him. Hmm. He is a speech. Rita, my beautiful. 
Does your husband know about M.E.? I don't think so. In fact, I'm P-O-S-I-T-I-V-E. P-O-S... Give me that again, will you? (laughs) Well, I must go now, sweetheart. I will see you later. Wait. (laughs) These secret meetings can't go on any longer. I must tell my husband the name of my lover. Rita, be careful. He hasn't gone. His name, Thomas, is Charles Boyer. Yes, you might as well know. Uh, (laughs) I love your wife, and she's going away with me. Far, far away. How far can you go on four gallons a week? (laughs) That is my worry. Come, Rita, let us go. Oh, no, you don't. Take that. Ooh. I am shoes. Right in the pants of Manhattan. Charles, Charles, speak to me. You've killed him, Thomas. You've killed him. Oh, everything is going black. I cannot see. Uh, I am dying. Uh, hello? Who? Mr. Shapin? What? Very well. Naturally, if you feel that Kate Smith's picture should stay on the box, that is all right with me. What do I care? I am dying. (laughs) Dying, I tell you. Dying! Another colorful episode in the tales of Manhattan occurred when Mr. Charles Lutt, as a poor but talented musician, received an opportunity to perform at Carnegie Hall. Now, in our play, Mr. Lutton's part will be portrayed by Jack Benny, that eminent. Eminent what? The scene is backstage at Carnegie Hall. (laughs) Mr. Lutton is waiting to go on. Mr. Christian! (laughs) Mr. Christian! Where is my violin? Under your chin, sir. And tell me, Mr. Christian, did you sew up the bullet hole in these pants I got from Boyer? I couldn't find a needle and thread, so I put a cork in it. <laughs> oh. Now listen, Mr. Christian. I will walk out of that stage and play my violin as it has never been played before. Hey, what are you going to do, Charles Lawton? I am doing him now. <laughs> For my first number, ladies and gentlemen, I will play the meditation from Tai by Barney Dean. <laughs>
consequence in the tales of Manhattan, one was Edward G. Robinson, once a prominent lawyer, but now a Bowery derelict, is invited to a reunion of his college classmates. Mr. Robinson's part will be played by none other than Jack Benny, that talented. Talented what? <laughs> the following scene takes place <laughs> during the height of the banquet, when the college men discover that their former classmate is now a bum. Yeah. They invited me to come up here, yeah. You thought I was a businessman, yeah. Well, I ain't, see? I'm just a Bowery bum, see? But you stuff shirts wouldn't understand that. No. No, no, Edward, my boy. I ain't blaming you, Professor Harris. It ain't your fault, see? I can't understand it. You are the most prominent student in my class. <laughs> Why, you could speak everything from Italian to Egyptian. Oh, yeah? Good heaven, Vlad. Ain't there nothing I learned you stuck in your bean? <laughs> what? Say, which one of you is Robinson? I am, see? And if anybody's around here looking for trouble, I'm the guy that can get it home. Yeah. I'm tough, see? And that reminds me. There's something else I want to take care of right now. Hello, operator. You're in New York, see? New York? I want to speak to Mr. Chapin, the general food, see? Hello, Chapin. Let me tell you something. I've heard about enough of this, see? Either Kate Smith's picture goes off that box, see? And my picture goes on, see? Or I ain't waiting for next Sunday. Yeah. Oh, for heaven's sake, do you realize who you're talking to? I know what I'm doing. Now get away from me, see? What do you want? I thought I told you to stay away from my wife. Ooh. <laughs> I am shoot. <laughs> right in the pants of Manhattan. <laughs> When you budget your food dollars this week, make a certain that a part of each food dollar goes to the purchase of cereals. Whole grain cereals such as Grape Nuts Flakes. Now, why do I say that? Why, it's because whole grain cereals are a plentiful, thrifty source of food essentials all of us need every day for really robust good health. And you can't do better than choose Grape Nuts Flakes. For delicious, toasty brown Grape Nuts Flakes are a whole grain cereal, so they provide essential whole grain food values including iron and two of the important B vitamins, niacin and vitamin B1, both so necessary for steady nerves and abundant energy. And that whole grain nourishment is really economical food value, for when you buy Grape Nuts Flakes in the big 12-ounce economy package, it costs you but a penny a serving, a small price to pay for so much goodness. All-around nourishment plus rich, distinctive flavor. So give the folks a swell start for the day. You can do it the Grape Nuts Flakes way. Friends, for hot breakfast with more smiles per mouthful, serve your folks delicious hot Grape Nuts Wheat Meal. It's extra delicious, extra nutritious. It cooks extra fast. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.